Hello everyone and welcome back to One Soccer. I am your host for today, Josh Deming, and I do have a co-host with me. It's my friend, Alex Gange Ruzik. Alex, how are you doing today? Doing great. It's great to be in the, the same room for once. It's, it's fantastic. we got this beautiful studio here, so I'm doing great and excited uh, to, to chat footy as always. I, I'm excited too. I mean, what, what a job. I mean, shout out to everyone involved to get this thing set up. Very excited and we are here today to put our minds together and come up with a pretty fun little starting 11. We are going to take the starting 11 for the CONCACAF Nations going to the World Cup. So basically what we're going to do is take any player who they're playing for Costa Rica, Canada, the United States, or Mexico and come up with a best 11. Sounds easy enough, right Alex? It's a pretty straightforward job. Totally not going to be intense debate to try and figure out uh, this 18 or this 20 as we ended up deciding yeah it, it'll be fun and we want to give a quick shout out before we get started and if you can't tell by the insanely fantastic kit i found in the back max and crit paul it's 22. it's just old school kit. old school kit but we're gonna give him a little bit of love because he just won mls cup he picked up a nasty injury sacrificed himself to help his team Everything you want out of a keeper. A lot of love going to him. Unfortunately, won't be going to the World Cup, but we wanted to definitely show him some love. So with that being said, let's start off with the keepers. Why, why don't we? Do, does that sound good for you? For you? Yeah, I mean, let's do it. We can dive uh, into the keepers. Uh, probably go best to go back to front in this back, case. Back to front. All right. Uh, so we're going to bring two keepers, as we decided. So do you want to start off and tell us who is the backup keeper that we're bringing? Sounds good. I mean, in our... Uh, CONCACAF 20, we're going to have to have a working title, working title. for in, in terms of like what this, this squad's going to be and uh, what they're going to go to the World Cup as. But uh, CONCACAFIA, is, uh, is that too Concafia. much? Concafia. Is that too much? The nation of CONCACAFIA. But uh, starting in goal, I think it has to be a legend of CONCACAF at the World Cup. He might be, what, the best CONCACAF goalie ever at World Cups in, in history. It's, uh, uh, you know, Guillermo Ochoa, yeah. the, the legend himself, the, the saves against Brazil, those heroic performances in uh, 2018. He's still kicking around at 2022, and I'm sure he still has some magic in his boots. Uh, so I have to go Guillermo Ochoa, still uh, playing in Liga Max, doing a great job uh, with Club America, the Los Aguias. And when you see the, the keeper that's going to be in front of him, I mean, it, he, he's achieved so much. He's a, just a veteran presence that you'd like there. He's always had fantastic World Cup performances. When push comes to shove, he's not a bad bet, but... I don't know if there's much debate because, I mean, if you look at his performance at the World Cup, Ochoa definitely has the quality there. I mean, there's no de debating that. But when you look at the overall career path of the number one keeper we're going to have, I don't think it's much debate. It's Kaylor Navis. Now, his performance at the one of the World Cups in 2014 got him his move to Real Madrid, where he went on and won the Champions League, of course, a couple of times there. Probably one of the best keepers in CONCACAF history. I don't know if, if that's is that too strong of a statement. Or is that probably pretty fair? Well, if Ochoa is one of the best World Cup goalkeepers yeah. in CONCACAF history, I think uh, Kaylor Navas is one of the best. Certainly one of the most disrespected overall goalkeepers in history. Just how good he's been and how forgotten he's been. What, three Champions Leagues? Yeah. All the, the, the resume speaks for itself. So I think that's pretty straightforward. He's still balling out, still in his prime for goalkeepers. They can obviously, you know, he's in his mid-30s, but still balling out. But I mean, right there, I mean, between those two keepers, the starting one will be Kaylor Navis, but it's not a bad bet whatsoever. Very excited for, to see him and see if they can come up with some magic. Remember that Costa Rica side topped a very talented group. And on top of that, they were shoot out away from potentially some historical scenes going to the semifinals. So after that, we're gonna move on to the right back position and we're going back to front as, as we're doing. It seems like I'm gonna be doing the, uh, the, uh, the, the starter because I mean, you have the whiteboard. So who is the backup right back we're gonna be going with? We do not have a backup right back. We, we just, don't. Okay. We, we just <laughs> have we mid have mid we have a right back. Uh, obviously, with twenty, it's tough because you're gonna have to leave some positions. So as you see, as we'll go along in this lineup, we do have some guys who can moonlight as different positions. I mean, it's it's the Canadian, right? If John Herdman is the coach, which spoiler alert, I think uh, he's certainly a strong candidate to be the coach. Versatility is a great thing. But our starting right back for for now, Sergio Dest of AC Milan. Now certainly. Uh, they're doing great again this year, uh, pushing up the Champions League, pushing up Serie A. Uh, the former Barcelona man, uh, very skilled, is going to be able to get forward. Uh, has improved his defending a lot. So I think Sergio Dest in, in a you know sea of very good Concacaf fullbacks, I think he, he leads the way just uh, due to that. I mean, at, at such a young age, it's because he's not in excellent form this season. I believe he's got one start, four appearances. He's had his his troubles, obviously getting this new move, but. 
you can't deny the fact that he's played at the the best level like he's played for a very good Ajax team he got that move to Barcelona he's playing in La Liga now he's in with AC Milan at such a young age there's so much attacking talent there a little vulnerable I'd say probably at the back but in terms of CONCACAF I think that this is a good bet you also can hit it from distance which I think is fair to say well I mean we look at also uh, some of the other positions like on the wing for example we have some very defensively responsible wingers so you always want freewheeling fullbacks in the modern game so I can, can never have too many of those there you go so then who's going to be the in charge of I guess allowing the fullbacks to get up the pitch. We'll take a look at the center backs before we roll on to left back. So I believe, again, without me looking at we have three center backs. So we'll start with Correct. the third center back then. Sounds good. And right now on the bench, uh, we have someone who unfortunately will not be going to Qatar as he's picked up an injury. But in this case, we are living in a hypothetical scenario where, yeah. you know, time heals all wounds and we're going to the World Cup with our Concafia squad filled to the brim with, with healthy ballers. And in this case, we've got Chris Richards of Crystal Palace. Uh, he certainly has had quite the adventure, spent his time at Hoffenheim, Bayern Munich, but right now in the Premier League. Uh, he's gotten a few appearances, if I'm not mistaken, before injury has, has kind of, you know, made made his integration into the Premier League tough. But he's a very talented, young American center back is Chris Richards. And I think it's good depth to, to have him as the next man up on our bench. I think so, too. And I think the big thing is that he was playing very consistent minutes in the Bundesliga with Hoffenheim. He, he's got that ability to play over a season. It's unfortunate the way he started with Crystal Palace, but... He's just such a talented player. I think the ceiling is so high that it was very difficult for us to leave him out of the starting 11. But again, you, you think of a season, you want to focus on a little bit of form. And unfortunately for Richards, he just hasn't had that. But someone who has had some very good form, and we lead into the two center backs that will be starting. On the right-hand side is Cameron Carter-Vickers. This was a bit of a debate, eh, Alex? Like I, the, the, A lot of pros I was looking at him is the fact that, I mean, he's obviously starting, has a ton of minutes right now with Celtic, who are sitting top of the league by Far right now the best team in the Scottish League also cha playing the Champions League but like you pointed out wasn't the best performance they finished in the basement of the group and were eliminated but there's a lot of talent there there's been some interest in linking him back to the to Premier League I, I think that this kid is a talent and I think that there's a good chance he could potentially start at this World Cup for the US which is why I, I think we agreed to put him in the starting 11 for our CONCACAF and I can't remember what you said, but that's starting 11 for us. What do you, what do you have, what's your take on uh, Carter Vickers? Well, I just, I think, first of all, it's tough at center back because if you look at the top defenses in CONCACAF, this qualifiers, Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, yeah. they were team defenses. I mean, we'd love to give our guy here, Kamal Miller, a shout, for example. Uh, but, you know, you look at the U.S., they've got this depth of center backs playing at a high level. And I think Cameron Carter Vickers with Celtic, uh, he's been doing a great job. He's really coming to his own. I think he's going to go to Qatar, it seems like, uh, with Celtic and, you know, right, rightfully so based on how, how good he's been. So I think it's it's understandable. And I think we're going to that kind of leads nicely into our third name, which, spoiler alert, is also American. I mean, for whatever it is, they could may, they maybe didn't end up getting the, the defensive record they should have had based on some of the talent they had. But we end up going Tim Ream, uh, the Fulham veteran. He's been up and down the championship uh, Premier League the last few years, but he's playing in the Premier League. Fulham's been you know, they've been causing a ruckus to a lot of big teams this year with the, the new look Fulham side. This might be the best Fulham yeah. side yet after a few yo-yo seasons. And he's kind of led the way as a veteran presence at the back. 35, I mean, maybe that was why he, did, he wasn't overly used for the United States in World Cup qualifying. Maybe they should have been. 35 years old, he's played almost every minute for Fulham, who's sitting at time of recording in ninth place in the Premier League. That is something that you don't <laughs> see every day. He's playing at the, high, like the highest levels in terms of the league. Uh, he's played very well. This Fulham team's a lot of fun. I mean, they do concede goals. There's just there's no, no <laughs> offense about Sabeto, but he's the captain of that team. He's a leader, and I think that he'd be a very important asset to potentially bring, and especially playing alongside a younger Cameron Carter-Vickers. So those are the two center backs. We've talked about three Americans in a row now, so now it's time to roll over to the left back position. I'm assuming you guys know who we're going to do. We didn't want to play him too high up the pitch because there are some other elements, but at left back, we went with Alfonso Davies. Probably... I'm also going to say probably the best player in CONCACAF, playing at his natural position, which he doesn't usually do at uh, at international level. But, I mean, he's, he's won basically everything. There's already one in the game. He's 22 right now. I mean, he's just an incredible player. What, what can you tell everyone? Maybe touch a little bit on him playing at the left-back position for someone who maybe not understand what he could potentially bring because there's not a lot to say about Alfonso Davis, which some people don't already know. Well, I don't know. I feel like if you're doing a CONCACAF 11, you're writing his name in like in permanent yeah. ink. Just like depends you just, where. You just write him in and then you kind of build around him. And I think in this case, what he can bring at left back from deep positions, if he has the support behind him, Obviously, we know the the world, you know, world class skills. Almost, you could say, in the final third going forward, and yeah. he's improved his defending a lot over yes. the last three, four yes. years. He's a 
proper one of the best defend defensive fullbacks uh, in the in you know the top five European leagues based on his stats, based on you know just his one v one duels, etc. So I think you can be comfortable with what he can bring going forward. And as we're going to see, the midfield is very solid, and it's going to allow him uh, to to go forward. And then from there, you know we we know what he can also do coming back. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, lastly, before we forget, also Anthony Robinson of yes. uh, Jedi, as they yes. sometimes call him, is also the backup left back in so, case we forget. So we got a lot of depth yeah. there. This is why Alex has the list to remind me. But yeah, I mean another another one playing beside um, Reem in the the Premier League. You can't get over that. But I mean with Davies, yeah, I mean he's obviously very talented going forward. But his ability to track back is so important. And you don't. It's often time when Bayern have the ball because they have so much possession. He's always on the attack. But I like. The whereabouts of his game he always knows where he is in the pitch he's got the ability to track back because he's got that speed which allows him to attack uh he's gonna start there it's no doubt about it and we got robinson that's a very solid backup again premier league proven on a very fun to watch fulham side as well so now we'll move on to the midfield and we'll let you start and tell, let me know before i say the wrong number of midfielders how many do we have and we're starting from the bench in forward sounds good we have six midfielders we have a three three-man midfield here we're going 4-3-3 by the way if we maybe didn't mention it off the top but we're going for just a good old classic 4-3-3 can't canadian 4-3-3 though can, it can it can yeah, shift yeah. you know yeah, back depends. three playing in possession or a 4-4-2 etc we're going we have a six uh, a more advanced eight and then a more middle you know eight so we'll start with the six backup premier league guy we talk a lot about a lot of premier league experience yeah. in the squad and it's another american uh, a lot of Americans on this squad. Again, a talented. Yeah, certainly it's can't it's doubt the talent coming yeah. out of the U.S. Maybe just a question of how it comes together. Certainly in our CONCACAF nation, we're banking a lot on, on the U.S. here. But we got Tyler Adams, who's adjusted nicely to life in the Premier League with Leeds, uh, playing the number six role there. Very intense role. He's, he can cover a lot of ground. He's improving his game and possession a lot. You know, he's always been solid at that from his days at Red Bulls, be it New York or Leipzig. So I think uh, Tyler Adams a good fit. Yeah, again, when it comes to the CONCACAF players, when it happens to developing them in my opinion there's no place i'd rather them develop than the bundesliga it's just tyler adams i really enjoyed him he, he was a bit of a versatile player as well i mean he saw him feature as like a right wing back from time to time but he's at his best in my opinion in the midfield he's doing very well with jesse marsh and leeds but he's on the bench which means that there's other players that are also on the bench with him so who's the next one on the list yeah if we're going up the on the bench we'll we'll go with just the slightly higher number Sorry. eight that's Yunus musa of Valencia, the youngster. I think he may actually be the youngest player in the squad, funnily enough. So. Yeah, other than him and Chris Richards are kind of the, the young... The, this is a very young team, though, must Mer be said. American again. American again. But yes, uh, yeah. Yunus Musa, Valencia, the, the former Englishman. Uh, he's very versatile all around. Number eight yeah. can play number six. I think he really would fit in the this this CONCACAF, you know, not, you know best 20, and I'm excited to to say, see him as a backup in this situation because I think he can bring great youth energy off the bench. He's played on the wing before. Yeah. He can kind of be a bit of a jack of all trades. So it's what you, what you want when this Canada shifting 4-3-3 is exactly, it's nice to have. Exactly. But plays in a very technical league. Big fan of the league of myself. Uh, uh, he, he's developed so much. Came in, I, I believe, at a 17-year-old and is getting a ton of reps. He's an out-and-out -out starter right now. So very good option. But moving up to that attacking eight now is a player that I... I enjoy watching a lot, and I think that it's just controversy in this video is because he's not in the actual starting 11, and that's Gio Reyna. And when it comes down to it, it's hard to know because there's so much hype around Gio Reyna, and he's done such incredible things in his short opportunities had with Dortmund because he's injured quite a bit. I mean, he's just coming back. He scored his first goal, I believe, of the season. It was a penalty. A very creative player. You can see him play on the wing, play, play as an 8, play as a 10. I think he's got one of the highest ceilings in CONCACAF, but until he can find a way to stay consistent, to get these reps, to get, and that's what I'm talking about of players who, who are doing it right now and getting these reps and proving that they're basically able to play a full season and continue to do it. We've seen a lot of players doing that, and right now Gio hasn't really proven he's able to do that, so it's hard to kind of judge him compared to the three midfielders we're starting. But what is your thoughts on Reyna? And is it, are we being a little harsh maybe keeping him out of our starting 11? I think it's fine. He's he's also one of the youngest players on the team. He oozes talent. Yeah. And I think we can't doubt the talent. Like He, he plays, he's silky. He can play the number 10. He could play as a winger. I mean, I'd love to see him as a false nine based on yeah. the way he sees yeah. the game. Yeah, it's true. One, one day, maybe. So I think Reyna, definitely in our squad, no doubter. But in terms of what's in front of him, it is a tough battle. Because, I mean, we're going to go into the starters shortly here, maybe starting with the number six. I can throw that to you after this. But, you know, with that experience off of him, it's nice to have a joker like Reyna. I'd almost yeah. call him a joker just because of that talent he brings. Maybe you're down a goal and... You need something. You maybe it's been a nothing game. You're down one nil. You've been struggling in midfield. He has that, that that X factor about him, and I think given his his age, 
It wouldn't be a bad thing to have him come off the bench. We're going to revert back down a little bit back to that six, and we're going to go over to Mexican International, plays for Ajax. He's been there for a few seasons. It's Edson Alvarez. Now, this was the debate. You and I were debating about who we wanted to see as that six. You were, I think you were leaning a little bit more toward Tyler Adams. I had to shift you a little bit towards Edson Alvarez. I mean, he's... He was linked to Chelsea, for example, in the summer for $50 million. I mean, this player has got huge potential. He's got a lot of suitors looking at him. He ended up staying at Ajax, playing in the Champions League. I believe they have, they're have they sitting in second place, but I think they have a game in hand, so they could leapfrog up. But he's been a player who's been doing it for Ajax for a few seasons now. He's done it for Mexico. He's a very talented, shut-down number six, someone who I would trust back there. He's got pace. He's got strength. There's not a lot of bad things I can say about Edson, which is why I want to give him that little nudge in front of Adams because I wasn't overly convinced with the start of Leeds this season they were struggling a little bit and a lot of pressure was on Adams but tell me what you know and what you like about Edson Alvarez so it's a no-brainer I think he's kind Maybe of a bit so. a, a modern a modern number six I think ultimately we we look at the the core of this team I think yeah Adams certainly in the discussion but you ultimately look at at you know what Alvarez brings he's he's modern he can play with the ball at his feet I can defend very well. I think we're going to need that in this team, and that's maybe what gives him the edge yeah. over Adams. Maybe if we had a little more of a conservative back four, maybe then a guy like Adams could have played that role he kind of does for, for Leeds. So I think Alvarez is a very good shout, and what he's shown for Ajax over these couple of seasons, he's consistently been one of the best midfielders in CONCACAF for, for good reason. I think would be a deserved starter on our team. And it's going to allow our next player to do what he does, and that's just get up a little bit further up the pitch because the next player, Canadian international, Stephanie Stacchio, and I think this is really the debate will come in from some of the Americans wanting Gio to get in there. But in terms of a player whose stock has risen so much ever since basically making that, getting that move to Porto, but he earned that move from Porto from his performances with Canada. And right now, just for those who don't know, this central midfielder who's got a little bit more of an advancing role to him, he's got one goal, four assists in the league right now. He's played all six Champions League matches for Porto who topped their group, picking up two goals in there as well. He does a lot more than that for Canada, one of the most irreplaceable players. He can play deeper, he can play basically wherever John Herman wants him to play. But I do like him when he gets the ability to have like an Edson Alvarez under him, allowing him to push forward because he shows that he can produce on the pitch, whether it's goals, assists, influencing the match. His, his stock has been incredible. He's been a great story to watch. He is the definition of a box to box. He will go from <laughs> this box to this box consistently. I think he was top 10 in kilometers covered this year in the Champions League. Uh, just in terms of raw numbers, which is ridiculous. Like he's playing and he's everywhere when you watch him in the game. So I, I like the idea of us having him as an eight and maybe having Alvarez clean up a bit under him. Because you know you're going to get defense from Ustakio. He's always going to be defensive, responsible. He's always gets his interceptions, his duels, et cetera. But there's a, an element of his game that we saw a glimpse of it last year at the Gold Cup where he went and played a little higher up the field yeah. and scored those three goals. But then at Pacos de Ferreira, they needed him to be a six, so he kind of sacrificed his offense. And I think Porto realizes that there's something into the game the way he, you know, he maybe doesn't shoot the ball the hardest, or he doesn't, you know, he's not doesn't have a 60 yard switch in his in his arsenal, but he just reads the final third so well. Like you see all of his goals and assists, he arrives in the right place and makes the right decision. So I just think that sort of cerebral offensive play will will complement the next guy very nicely. We talk about guy who makes great late runs into the box. Yeah. I was going to say, when you're talking about like just being able to know when to, to join the attack, if you watch some of Steph's goals recently, it's just knowing when. He's just taking that look, taking that look, makes that bolt in, and it's just finishing off a play. It's fantastic to do, but it's, it's tricky to know when because what Porto playing a 4 4 2 system, you, kept, you got a midfielder like that going up. You're very light in the midfield going back, so you got to be very. Yeah, they'll have a lot of footballing IQ to be able to make those type of decisions. Otherwise, it can catch you. Another player that's very good at doing that, another American, is the one I'm a fan. I'm, again, when I'm talking about the, the Bundesliga development, came through Schalke. Like he's, yep. I got his time and he got his name at Schalke before moving over to Juventus, and that's Weston McKenney. Um, aerial threat. I'm box to box, but I mean, Juventus have played in a 4 4 2, and he's been pushed out wide, similar to kind of like Musa. Mm -hmm. He's a very unique profile. Very I really unique. I love him in this midfield. I think all three of them would complement each other very, very well. But I'm a big fan of Weston. I like what he's doing with Juventus, and I think that potentially could be one of the most important players for the U.S. at this upcoming World Cup. He's a bit of a unicorn. I think he, he, there's not many players like his profile, just in the tense that it's unique. Like, he's he's a midfielder. He's not necessarily a guy who's going to, again, play much with the ball at his feet in terms of he's not going to progress the ball. He's not going to kick it very far or anything. But in terms of just reading space in the final third, he does a great job of finding space, being an option to play off of, making late runs in the box. And I think what's nice is with Alvarez and Eustachio, 
they almost tuck in as a pivot at times, I think. Yeah. And they're going to do a lot of the work. And that kind of just allows McKenney. We've seen from Juventus. We've seen the U.S. If you allow him just to do his thing in the final third, he's not a conventional number 10. He's more of a, like, cause chaos in yeah. the box, you know, almost number 10. I think the midfield would complement each other very nicely. And I think McKenney, you look again at Dest whipping in balls, Davies whipping in balls, Pulisic, Lozano, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get to some of these other names, you know, Buchanan, Corona. I'm not going to spoil where those those guys are at in the order, but there's some great crossers of the yeah. ball. A guy like Weston McKinney could thrive in those late runs, especially through Stacchio, Alvarez, covering a lot of ground and doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the ball progression. Got a really good personality as well. Watched two uh, Juventus documentaries. Just a fun player to have around. He's got quite the celebration. I absolutely love it. Not when it's obviously happening. Questionable taste in food, though. Questionable taste in food. Yeah, don't tell Kalini that. But we're going to move now up to the main attackers. The front three that should be providing the goals and the assists. I say should be because, like we mentioned, a lot of talented midfielders. But let's start on the right-hand side with... Or we do have a back. We do have a backup right right, right winger. All these positions now. All of them do. Perfect. All right. So. So who is our backup right winger? Well, it's one of Canada's finest, Tejon Buchanan. He's taken the Champions League by storm this year. Club Rouge, his first year, full year, calendar year with the, yeah. the club. Uh, he's currently in his first full season. Uh, he's been excellent ever since returning from that injury. That kind of derailed the start of his season. We have him at right wing now. Obviously, he's been playing more as a fullback, wingback. But what's nice is with Dest, uh, you know, we're going to need some more defensively responsible wingers. And I think it's great that both of these guys that we're going to talk about are very defensively responsible, especially Buchanan. I think yeah. it might be the most underrated part of his game is how good he is defensively. And then going forward, I mean, he's just he's ex- explosive. He loves taking guys on 1v1. He, he's good at getting the byline, creating shots for himself. I think you always need that sort of wild card threat on the winger. Like if you're going to be a winger, you have to bring something. And yeah. it, it's like creativity. It's a goal threat. It's, it's defense and Buchanan, I think he just brings that 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 1v1 and, and, and chance creation threat and he can create for himself and I think sometimes obviously wingers you want to create for others but it's nice to have that guy who can go and just make something out of nothing. Yeah and I get personally frustrated because I just like seeing him further up the pitch. 4-3-3 system I want to see him play as a right wing. He's been doing that from time to time with the Club Rouge this season but he does feature I'd say primarily as like a left wing back right wing back. He's even played as a right back at time to time. He's very versatile which is like we said anywhere on the right hand side. formation. This, yeah this very- switching kind of Canada formation we're going to have going on here. He'll be able to cover multiple positions and you talk about a player taking game. One of my favorite performances from Tejan Buchanan was against Mexico oh, in the Gold Cup stunning. semifinal. The way he just decided this is my game. I don't care if I'm on the right, I don't care if I'm on the left. I'm going wherever I want and everything's going through, through me. A little bit Davies-like from time to time but it's one of my favorite performances from him rocking the famous number 12 Canada kit which is also yeah. kind of clever before switching over to number 11. But now who's the man who's going to be in front of him then? Yeah, well, it's again, look at the winger depth in CONCACAF. It's it's remarkable. It's Chucky Lozano over at, you know, Napoli this year. The darlings yes. of Europe, you could yeah. say. They've got, they play fun soccer. They've been doing well in the Champions League. They've been doing well. Serie A, and I think, you know, Chucky Lozano has been a big part of that. Irv- Herving, Chucky Irving. Loza- yeah. Lozano, I'll make sure to, to add in, uh, you know, dynamic winger. Uh, he's improved really his, his goal scoring threat. He's scoring a lot more headers now, scoring with his feet, but he's always been creative. He's always been quick. You know, just a guy that gets into the final third and he makes things happen. I think you need that in the, this team. You, you know, a guy who can just go at defenders and, and compliment. You know, we're going to you know get to some of the number nines. There's number nines, we're good at having guys play off of them. And I think Lozano, he's a, he almost plays as an inside forward at, at, at times. But also, most importantly, he's defensively responsible, which I think we're going to need with, our, you know, right. Dest being there at back, fullback. So, back-minded fullbacks that we're going to have in this team. <laughs> it, all, it, all, it all kind of balances together nicely, I'd say, in this it formation. The, the thing I like so much about Chucky Lozano is the fact that he's just like a little pit bull. Yeah. You've you seen him smash his teeth off of, of knees. He's, he's one of the most fouled players that there is in Serie A. But he's he's always looking to make that final pass to score some goals. He's adding that to his game in a very talented Napoli side already, topping a very difficult group with, with Liverpool. Obviously, they're sitting top of the Serie A. They're, they've been fantastic to watch. He's been a big part of it. And when he's in the mood, he can be a bit of a game changer. But we're going to switch flanks now over to the left-hand side. And who is the backup left or left winger? Yeah, well, for, for now, we got Tecasito Corona Injured. of Sevilla. Unfortunately, will not be going to the World Cup. But again, for Concafia, he's like... Key servant off the bench uh, at left wing. Uh, he is a very good, you know, useful piece to have because he is versatile. We talked about maybe Dest having a lack of backup. Well, Tejon Buchanan can play right back. Tecito Corona can play right back from his time at Porto. He did talk back, play right back. He is so defensively responsible and he's such an all around winger. And I think those kinds of players are underappreciated because wingers, again, I kind of mentioned it before, they're technically 
usually have that one skill, that one thing. But the nice thing about Crown is he can do a lot. He can create shots for himself, but he can also be a crosser. He can, you know, take guys 1v1. He can be more of a, you know, team, just the possession option. And I think, you know, that's always good to have that versatility as a winger because it can really allow you to shift your styles tactically, which I think uh, we're probably going to do a lot of. Yeah, I, I think it's similar to Buchanan. Uh, again, I think he personally, I can't speak to this. I don't know him. Same as I don't know what Buchanan's thinking, but I think both of them like playing a little bit higher up the pitch, but they know what the game's about. They know that when they have to drop back, they want to play in the right wing back role, right back role. They're able to do so. They've proven they can do it at club level as well. So very useful players. Unfortunately, he's not able to make it off to the World Cup. But I mean, getting that move from Porto to Sevilla just shows the type of player he was. At the time, Sevilla was just, you know, <laughs> They're having a tough season this year, but they are usually a Champions League-based team out of La Liga, so it's unfortunate, but there's a man in front of him. There's been a recent graphic that came out, the LeBron James of soccer. This guy's like the phenom guy, right? He's like the LeBron James of soccer? Definitely. Is leading the way at left wing. Now, I like Kristen Pulisic a lot. I do like him, but I just think it's hard and, and when I'm looking at this list, at least on my side, I'm just, I like to focus a little bit on form as well. It's very difficult to look at Christian Pulisic right now. Almost made me want to put Alfonso Davies up to keep him off, but that's too cruel. Because when Pulisic is at his best, he is comfortable, he's happy, he can produce. We've seen him do that before, but right now playing on at right wing back or coming on in the last 15, he's not getting the looks that can get him playing the best way possible. But when he does do that, when he plays for the United States and he's got the captain armband on and he knows that there's... There's pressure and he's here to perform he he often does yeah well i mean if we're talking lebron james of basketball i don't want to be mean and say he'd be close to russell westbrook these days uh, but right. yeah, no, that's fair. jokes aside i think in terms of christian pulisic very talented player and like you mentioned when he's when he's in the right mindset when he's in the right form he can ball out so i'm very comfortable having him as our starting left wing in this situation I personally have always thought a combination of him and Alfonso Davies on one flank yeah. would always be very fun with how Pulisic tends to tuck in. I think with having Davies at fullback will allow, you know, Pulisic to, to, to really thrive because I think, you know, at the U.S. he's always looked at his best with Robinson behind him overlapping and, yeah. and filling in the gap. So I think Pulisic uh, in this, in this you know, hypothetical scenario would be, you know, this just you look again we're going to get to the number nines you look at the midfield he has behind him the fullbacks this would really be a position where he can thrive and i don't think at the club level since dortmund he hasn't really had a chance to play in those sorts of situations and we talk about his form you know wavering you have to sort of give credit to him in the sense that he's adjusted some tough situations and produced despite that but i think if you could put him in a system like this that gets the most out of him like he he is one of the best 1v1 players in CONCACAF. He's so dynamic when he gets in those situations. I think he could be a real wild card uh, for this team, the way he cuts in and makes things happen. Yeah, I mean, when, when he's at his best, he's, you can't debate it. He's, he's a great player. It's just unfortunately for right, right now, after just kind of locking in that starting role, a lot of managerial turnover, he just hasn't really been able to hold it on. But we're going to move over now to two positions left. And it's, well, one, two players left in one position. It's the striker. We're going to go for our backup striker. And I, I have a little bit of issues putting him on, but I get where you're coming from, just looking at the, the depth of these CONCACAF strikers, Raul Jimenez. Now, incredible striker. Like, he was an incredible striker at Wolverhampton Wanderers. It is a shame what happened to him. Yeah, it's a tough. horrible, horrible injury. It's it's Code Red was a really, really good documentary that came out on YouTube on him. It's it's unbelievably sad, and he just hasn't been able to replicate that same form that, in at time, he was the, the tier one level of CONCACAF striker right now, but he hasn't been able to to reproduce that but we're hoping that i mean i at least personally hoping that he's able to find that form once again but what is the number one reason you wanted to put him on this list as that backup striker well he certainly showed glimpses and i think he's just if you're talking pure number nines he's a number nine like if you think of what is a number nine ralph jimenez at his best from his days with porto his days with wolves he just understands how to play with his back to goal he understands what to do with the ball at his feet but he's good at heading the ball and he's good at occupying defenders and i think the number nine role to me, it gets portrayed as a, as a goal scoring role. Like, oh, you score goals. But I think ultimately the best at their craft, they, they disrupt, they involve themselves in the buildup. They, you know, they make runs in the box and he ticks all those boxes. Like he's about as versatile all around as a number nine as you can get. So I think because of that, he, you know, he fits the idea of a number nine. And I think he's shown glimpses of his form. Obviously it was a tough injury. And then ultimately you look at the other positions, like the U S can't pick a number nine. So we weren't going to pick a number nine from yeah. there. So <laughs> ultimately it came down to him and I have no qualms with it. Yeah. I mean, again, he's still playing in the Premier League. Yeah. He's playing the best league of the world. He's playing for a struggling Wolves side, but I used to like to take a look at Jimenez when he was at his best, almost kind of like the way Benzema or Harry Kane play. 
dropping deep. Mm-hmm. They have the ability to, to set things up for themselves. They're strong on the ball, and they can go into the box and obviously finish it off. I, I really like what he used to do. He used to, been, he used to be everything for Mexico. Everything went kind of through him, and he often finished it off, but he hasn't obviously been that player in some time, and we're hoping that he can find a way to do it. But in terms of Comcast strikers, absolutely had the role to potentially play in this hypothetical team. One final player on our list, and it is my boy, Jonathan David. <laughs> absolutely brainer. just... Can't say enough about Jonathan David. I'm really excited to see what's potentially going to happen in his future after this World Cup, whether he gets that move. But right now, his focus is on Lille, and he's consistently proven that he can score at a top five level for the third year running. He's got nine goals, three assists, and 14 appearances right now at time of recording, and he's just a joy to watch. I think some some top six team in the Premier League will probably take a look at him. He's producing for Canada, 22 goals and 34 appearances. The man can put the ball in the back of the net, and when you're in a hypothetical World Cup with this hypothetical team, what more do you want than a goal scorer? Yeah, he can score with his right, he can score with his left, he can score with you know, some feints, he can score one-time finish, he can put away penalties. I'm sure he can score some headers. He doesn't do much of them, doesn't yeah. need to. He's more so cerebral, and I think Jonathan David, he's a modern number nine. We talk about number nine profiles. Uh, he's so good at dropping deep and being creative and playing with his feet and being involved in the buildup. And I think he's at his best when he does that. So I just, I look at this team. He's like a perfect fit already on form. He's the best number nine in CONCACAF. And we look at our team here. He's going to drop in. He's going to open up space for Lozano and Pulisic to run. Obviously, Davies and Dest are going to get forward. He's going to combine with Dustakio McKenney. He's going to almost be like a decoy. He drops the center back, follows David. McKenney makes the late yeah. run in the box, and you get the, the header on, onto the ball. And then Magic, Magic he gets, gets, gets the, the Harry Potter wand out. So, David, in terms of form, it's a no brainer you look at the team it's a fit i mean i'm just you know it's enthused I, i'm enthused by seeing how he fits in this piece of the, this puzzle that we've got here so you kind of you kind of hinted to it earlier but who's gonna be in charge now who is going to be the manager to take over this team and potentially bring them to a world cup i mean right and vote for ted lasso yeah, but right, uh right, right. it's not much of a debate is it like out of the different managers that have taken these teams i mean if you look at the u.s we've had you have a number i think it's 10 u.s players on this yes. right now they are importing more players than Canada and the U.S., any other, obviously, nation in CONCACAF to Europe. They have a huge depth pool, and they were the second or third best team in World Cup qualifying. I mean, it's you got to take a look at management right that way. It's just you have to do it. But at the same time, Greg did win two tournaments, so it is up for debate. And then there's Tata Martino, who I think would be a, a tough look there, just considering that, I mean, I don't even know how much Mexico won him there. I mean, I think he's honestly a great coach in a less than ideal circumstance. Yeah. Personally, I think what he did at Atlanta and all that. So I don't know. Maybe. Managed Barcelona for a season as well. So, so, so maybe I'd say. Yeah. I think ultimately what we're leaning for it's John Herdman. Let's not yes. let's not beat around the bush yeah. in that regard. It's John Herdman. He's you know he, we saw what he was able to do with Canada. We have seen the leadership, the speeches. I'd love to know what his you know a weapon of choice say it is for canada if it was if it's a sword for canada like what's it going to be for concafia uh, you know is it going to be like b- digging a, a hole and putting a yellow card in the ground to symbolize like you know the yellow cards of concacaf i don't know but it's going to be herdman the leader and i think maybe we can uh, say that uh, tata martino and greg Berhalter will, will be assistant be assistant that's fair that's fair that's fair but the main question i mean we're gonna go over the very quickly the starting 11 for everyone just to kind of sum it up the main 11 that will be on, it's a 4-3-3 system. We have Taylor Navis in net, Serginho Dest at right back. We have Cameron Carter-Vickers at center back with Tim Ream. Very you know, interesting. Well, I'm going to get you to think about a captain here in a sec. Oh, Speaking that's a great choice. I was going to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah, so. but, because I thought of Tim Ream. You know, at left back, we have Alfonso Davies. The three central midfielders is the more natural number six. Edson Alvarez to your more kind of box-to-box. Eight, Stephanie Stacco. You're attacking eight, Weston McKinney. Right wing is Chucky Lozano. Left wing is Christian Pulisic. And your striker is Jonathan David. John Herdman is the head coach. Your captain out of that list. Who are you looking at? Gordon Keller Navas in goal. I, I, I think the Keller veteran. I think yeah. Tim Ream gives a good shot. This is a young team. It is. I'm looking like most of these guys are under 25, let alone, you know, under 30. Like, Ream is and Navas are the only ones above 30. So, like, it's a young team. David's 22. <laughs> you look at Lozano. He's like 26. Pulisic. 24 this is a young team yeah. so i think in the end navas he's he's won it all like he's the definitely the guy who's got the biggest trophy case here you look at the champions league he's been there in the big moments i think he'd be a good captain he's shown with costa rica that he can be a leader in no matter circum you know what circumstances uh, i can live with that yeah i can't i can't argue anything else like he's, he's a captain there's no reason to really argue that a lot of talented players but he's the guy to keep the glue together so we did this video now we're at the very very end and it comes down to one simple question, and that's it. We're wrapping it up. This 
CONCACAF best 11. CONCACAFIA? Yes, CONCACAFIA. This CONCACAFIA best 11 goes to a World Cup led by John Herman oh, and the man. assistant coaches of Greg and uh, Tata Martino. How do they do? Let's just pretend that they just take one of the spots. So you can pick your best. I mean, let's probably put them in the U.S.'s group. I think that's probably fair to say that's one of the easier ones. They take over for the U.S. They have their group right there with Wales, Iran, and England. Is that kind of kind of the group? How do you see it playing out? How far do you think that this, this best 11 could get? I'm looking at this team. Talent, and there's no shortage of it. There's just two things maybe going against them. Age. I think that this is a team that if we're in this hypothetical concafia, you know, situation, they're t- they're trying to have a good run in 2022 and then they're going for it in 2026. Like in 2026, Davies is going to be 26. David's going to, or Davies is going to be 25. David's going to be 26. Dest is going to be mid 20s. Lustakio is going to be 29. Lozano is going to be, you know, late 20s. Pulisic late 20s. Like this is a team that's not even close to its prime. I think because of that, it hurts. Ultimately, I'm looking at this team. I see a quarterfinal level team. I think they could go up against a team like England, give them a run for their money. I think against a Wales, they can certainly beat a Wales. There's a lot of Champions League, top five league talent in this team and some Champions League winning experience. I think they could take care of Wales. I think they could take care against Iran, even though it'd be a tough game. So in that case, they do that. They get to the, the knockout stages. I'd say quarterfinals is a reasonable run with maybe potential to go to the semifinals, given that they're so young and they've got that upside. But I think this would be more a team for 2026, but they could certainly do a good Canada. Similar story to the U.S. and Canada already. But no, I I, ag- I agree with you. I think that this is basically just a, a juiced up. I mean, there's a lot of U.S. players in there, but it's a juiced up U.S. team with a ton of talent. you got world-class talent like Navis and Davies going in there. Like you mentioned, despite all that, we couldn't really solidify. I think if we had like top tier, like... Like top six type Premier League level center back. I think yeah. you could maybe argue that. That would be a big game changer. But there is a lot of talent in that team. And I agree. I think that they would have not much issue in the group. I think they would have a run for money with England. Depending on the draw, I can see it. Yeah, like quarters to semifinal. I think, I think that's probably fair. So at the end of the day, the final question was, can this CONCACAF-based powerhouse win the World Cup? And uh, no, it's our is our answer so i mean let us know let us know <laughs> yeah. let us know for out to lunch on that how far do you think concafia could take the the tales of conca like maybe i don't know maybe they just lean into the concafiness and we get you know they, they they're they physical they're they're just throwing their hands out there and maybe that's the edge they need to win yeah. the world cup we you don't get, know you get cavalini off the bench oh we yeah, should we really should just really write really him in and in, in, in pan right now for talking <laughs> conca cap best there, 11. But- yeah, but let us know down in the comments if you agreed with our best 11, if you agreed with the 20 players that we're bringing, if you agreed with the management, the captain, all of it. Let us know down in the comments and let us know if you think that this side could win the World Cup. But hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. And if you did, as always, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub as well, and we'll see you guys soon. Cheers, friends.